Pennsylvania, her family moved to Los Angeles, where as early as 12, she was singing both as a soloist and in one of America's finest choirs. My family moved to California, and, and but I also did a lot of singing at that time. Um, I was a member of the Roger Wagner Chorale. So you you were doing both. You both. were both, yes, both. the chorus and you were. And also I was working a lot in the movies. I was from the time I was twelve. Again, I did a lot of background music. You know, ooh ah ooh ah ooh, or things like that. All kinds of things. And um, it's fun though, isn't it? I mean, that's quite, it was not quite only fun, fun, but I got to go to school because of the law, half a day at the various studio schools, and so I would meet all of these famous child actors, you know, like Mickey Rooney and <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor and all of these people. Oh, you know, yeah. So we, and of course, we didn't get any work done. We just diddled on our homework or something, you know. And um, I sang the biggest background music that I had ever done, which was the voice of Carmen in the movie Carmen Jones for Dorothy Dandridge. This was all in my 20th year. 20th year. <laughs> yes. And um, I was still in school. I was still at uh, USC. And uh, I was even making pirate recordings that were sold in supermarkets, which were the hits ah. of the day. You know, like, and in, in, in real imitation. I mean, I would try to sound like Peggy Lee and Kay Starr. But um, that, that was real, real mimicking. You know, but I did it for the money. I got forty dollars a session, and that meant a lot to me in those days. Absolutely, it was a lot of money. <laughs> well, yes, it went. I paid for several lessons. <laughs> By twenty is when I made my made debut in opera. And what was that? That was in The Bartered Bride. Bartered Bride. I played Vashek's mother, Hata. <gasps> and then, uh, then I graduated to The Sandman in, in Hansel, Hansel and Gretel. Gretel. Then I graduated to Hansel. Right. And oh, then the big thing that... Uh, I don't know if I was or not, but I had fun. But um, the next year, I, uh, they, gave, they brought Rossini's Cenerentola for me. So you, in many ways, were uniquely responsible and we're profoundly grateful to you for the whole Rossini revival. Amazing, isn't it? I didn't set out to do that. <laughs> I, you know, I was a soprano, and I had my whole uh, early years in Germany singing soprano roles. In the wintry West German coal mining town of Gelsenkirchen, Marilyn sang three or four leading roles each season. The last as Marie in the opera Wozzeck was reviewed by the leading German critic of the day. That review would provide her lucky break into big time opera. I got criticized by the great German critic whose name was H. H. Stuckenschmidt. And he came and gave me this marvelous review that said, I, 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 I know you all think I'm crazy or something like this, but this young American is the greatest Marie I have ever seen and heard. And I sent this review to my agent in California, and she sent it to San Francisco because they were doing Wozzeck in the fall in the San Francisco Opera, although it had been thoroughly cast. Well, the lady who sang Marie had to have surgery. And I got oh. married. Two days later, I sang an audition on the stage of the San Francisco Opera, and that was you it. Had to spring into and that. that was the beginning of the big time opera career. And then, um, you know, s sang in Chicago Opera at Covent Garden. I made my debut there, also in Wozzeck, and that that was fun because I was there. I auditioned for Glyndebourne, and was turned down. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite stories because. You know, they can be very, um, well, I don't want to use the word cold, but that's what it seems like to the auditioner that, or the auditionee, that uh, they're cold. And so here I was singing to this dark black hall in the, in the intermission, of course, while everybody was out with their picnic hampas. 
having their picnics on the lawn. lawn and you want it to be on the lawn. <laughs> right. And so finally, when after I sang something, I turned to the whoever was out there and I said, would you like to come up on stage and meet me? Well, that was just too cheeky, you know, too terribly American. So they turned me down. And I remember that I sang really well that day, Cenerentola and the Barber and things like that. <laughs> So about six months later, maybe eight, eight months, I can't quite remember, Joan Sutherland and I were singing Semiramide in what is now, I'm happy to say, a very legendary performance. And it was just one of those magical nights, you know, where the audience is going nuts. And at the end, when I was in my dressing room, a gentleman came in, and it was John Pritchard, who had been one of the judges at my audition. He was a at Blind 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 Blind. Right. Yes. And he came in, and he said, it appears we have made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but revenge. I never did sing in Glyndebourne. The beautiful yeah. revenge. Right. But she did sing at the Met. So much so that it was to become her second home. One of her most famous collaborations there was with Leonard Bernstein in a memorable production of Carmen. They've been kind enough to bring us one of your oh, amazing yeah. costumes from it was, Carmen. It was really thin days, too. <laughs> thin days. Oh, boy, yeah. For Carmen, we, we got the old weight down. <laughs> And this is, of course, the last act, and this is the death scene, you know, where she gets stabbed by Don Jose. And it was interesting, as a lot of people who did not know Carmen, especially younger people who came and talked to me about they thought this was a wedding dress. Ah. But of course it wasn't. Do you wasn't. think he did that deliberately? I don't know. I never asked him. You know. We had one wonderful moment with this production, though, because when I arrived at the first rehearsal, I almost fainted, because the whole stage was covered with carpet that thick, including the prompter's box had been carpeted over. And I just had a fit, because I said, you can't, you can't, we can't sing on carpet. And they said, this is a special acoustical carpet and all this kind of thing. So I was, I was kind of um, strong about it, and I said, I have to have a test. I need to test singing on the, car on the carpet with people in the audience whose opinions I trust. <laughs> and the verdict was? <laughs> that it was okay. That it was okay. But I'll never forget Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> he was the conductor. Yes, and after the test, he said, Now, Jackie, will you shut up about the goddamn car? <laughs> <laughs> For a minute to marriage to Henry. Yes. Your husband, mm -hmm. Henry Lewis. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's like any marriage, it had lots of ups and downs. Um, we had a wonderful life together for a while. Uh, we argued very, very much about music because we would, we worked together, you know, and I was, you know, not Trilby. So I had my own ideas, too, and we would argue greatly about a lot of things. <laughs> was he a pianist as well? Yes, he also played the piano, but he was a virtuoso double bass player. How extraordinary. And, and he was taken into the Los Angeles Philharmonic when he was 16. And believe me, in those years, that had to have been around 1949 or 50, I think, 51, something like that. And um, to take a black musician into a major symphony orchestra was a very big deal. Very big deal. It was also a pretty big deal to marry one and for him to marry me in 1960 also. Mm. Did we, you have opposition from your family? Yes, I did. Um, my mother... Did he? No, he did not. My, I knew them, of course, quite well by then. Um, my mother did not come to my wedding. She was really just... I afraid that her world was going to crash in around her. You know, sort of like, what will people think, that style. But it didn't. No, and within a couple of weeks, she came and apologized, and she and Henry became great friends. Mm. 